Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. We'll wait. We've got people trickling in. Hi, everybody. Welcome. We're going to hang tight for a little bit until our folks get added into the room. Thank you for joining us. All right, just watching that ticker move up. <laughs> I'll go ahead and get started then. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for Transforming Research in, with Data Curation Practices. And I especially wanna uh, welcome those of us in the US on our election day. We hope you've found time to go out and perform your civic duty um, or have a plan to do so later. Uh, my name is Gretchen Giggin. I'm the Member Experience Manager at the Center for Open Science. I work primarily on the Open Science Framework, or OSF, uh, which is our platform for open scholarship and sharing at all stages of the research lifecycle. Today, we're joined by the Data Curation Network, um, who are here to discuss how data curation can boost the accessibility, impact, and integrity of research. Um, we're hoping to talk about key curation practices, why they're essential for preserving and enhancing research, um, and how to apply them effectively to various types of materials. Um, we'll also at the end talk a little bit about ways you can include more curation activities in your usage of OSF. Before I introduce our guests, um, I just wanna do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you do have access to the chat today and we'd love to interact there with you as much as you would like. Um, but I would however ask that if you have questions for our speakers, um, that you put them in the Q&A. If you look in your Zoom toolbar, probably at the bottom of your screen, um, you should see a little section that says Q&A. Um, if you open that up, you can enter a question. Putting questions in there helps us to identify the questions and not lose them in the chat. And we also have a record of them to either answer live or in a text response. Also, you should be muted as attendees. Um, please keep yourself muted during our presentations just to keep background noise to a minimum. So now I'd like to introduce our guests. We're very excited to be joined by three members of the Data Curation Network. Uh, Michaela Narlock is director of the Digital Curation Net Network based at the University of Minnesota Libraries. Sophia Lafferty-Hess is the senior research data management consultant and curator for the Duke Research Data Repository at Duke University. And Wander Masalik is data curation librarian at the University of Minnesota. So thank you all so much for joining us. I will hand it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here, everyone, and to the Center of Open Science for not only proposing this, but allowing us to present this webinar. We are incredibly excited to, to be here today. Um, while we get our slides going, um, I invite you to, you know, take a deep breath if you can and, and join us for this hour. Um, we're really excited that you're here. All right, so we are here to talk about transforming research with data curation practices. As Gretchen mentioned, we can go to the next slide, Wanda. Um, there are three of us from the Data Curation Network who will be presenting today. So I'm Michaela, I am the far right on that screen. In a moment, you will hear from Wanda Marsalek and then Sophia Lafferty-Hess. Um, we can go to the next slide right away. Before we start talking at you too much, we want to know a little bit more about who you are. And so we want to know more about what disciplines you are coming from today. So you can use the QR code that Wanda has up on the screens right now, or you can go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and enter the code 4025978. I'll also put that in the chat. And you are, will be prompted to answer this um, multiple choice question where you can select up to three um, disciplines. This is just to give us a better sense of, of who we're talking with today. Awesome. This is amazing. So, and you can see Wanda um, is showing you the live results. After the webinar, we will take pictures of this to kind of archive in our slides. So that's why the screen was blank or the slide was blank at first. Okay, lots of social sciences, strong library science turnout, not super surprised. Health sciences, welcome, welcome, life sciences, arts and humanities and engineering. Okay, no, no physical science and mathematics folks today, but that's okay. 
or are there? Wanda, would you can you scroll down? Is there more? Nope. Okay. Oh, three per two percent. My apologies, physical science and mathematics uh, colleagues. We're also glad you're here. All right, let's give uh, 10 more seconds. If you haven't answered, please answer right now. And we are going to slowly transition to our next kind of get to know you question. So you can see Wanda is launching the next question. The next question is, what is data curation to you? You're from, it's complicated. That's funny. Um, <laughs> sorry, somebody in the chat just wrote, I'm from, it's complicated. So our new question is, what is data curation to you? Um, this is a, an, oh, a free text response, but we are going to be creating a word cloud. So we recommend a few words, maybe a phrase, not a, you know, whole paragraph that you may be able to write at the end of this session. Metadata, getting ready to add data to a pot. Yes, that data publication process. Love that. A lot of work. Oh my goodness. So relatable. <laughs> this is amazing. Ooh, skill. I like that. There's a lot of great words coming in. I'm I'm all for this. Oh, wow. There's, oh my goodness. There is so much coming in. I toward the future. I love that. That's a great one. Important. Adding value. Vital. Time consuming. Yes. It is certainly not a necessarily a quick process. But I see a couple more participants are, are still typing. Um, Preserving and archiving data, yep. Yeah, this is really great. Um, So there were, one of the reasons we wanted to ask this question was not only to get a better sense of kind of what expertise you all are bringing to this um, webinar, but also just to kind of get a gut reaction of, of how are you perceiving data curation and, and what can we add with our presentation that's forthcoming? Ooh, someone wrote memory making in the, in the chat. I like that. All right, 10 second countdown. If you're still typing your response, get it in now. Decision making, that's a good one. There are some really great words here I'm gonna have to use for future outreach stuff. So thank you all. <laughs> all right, we are gonna go ahead and go to the next and final kind of get to know you question. And this one is a yes or no, it'll take you It'll be very easy to answer. We want to know, is this the first time you've heard of the Data Curation Network or the DCN? Um, we just kind of want to get a gut reaction. Do you know all of this already? Uh, we don't want to be lecturing you if you already have heard of us. We could kind of skip through some things. So this is super great. So um, I don't know if anybody's just joined the conversation, but you can uh, vote in this at slido.com with the code 4025978, or you can use the QR code in the top left of the screen. Okay, so about two thirds, this is your first time hearing about the DCN. Welcome, we are we are so glad to meet your, to make your acquaintance. Okay, closer to half and half now, but still pretty cool. All right, 10 more seconds, and then we'll keep going. Okay, now it's really leveled out to closer to half and half. That's great. We're always happy to see familiar faces and friends. All right, let's, um, we're gonna dive in now to the webinar portion or our kind of presentation portion, I should say. Um, and before we do, I just wanna reiterate how, how thankful we are for your participation today. All right, so for that, you know, 58-ish percent of you who haven't heard of the Data Curation Network or the DCM before, welcome. Again, we're so glad you're here. The Data Curation Network is a trusted community-led network of curators who advance open research by making data ethical, reusable, and understandable. We are a consortium of now 25 academic and nonprofit data repositories across the United States who collaborate to share curatorial expertise 
And we do this through a number of ways, not all of which I will have time to, to go into today, but fret not, our email is at the bottom of the screen and it's datacuriationnetwork.org. Please follow up. I would love to tell you way more about the DCN than you could ever want to know. But in the meantime, I'm going to take a quick moment to tell you about our shared curation workflow on the next slide. So we're going to tell you a lot more about data curation momentarily, but I wanted to take a moment to highlight where curation fits in kind of in the research process. When you're getting ready to share your research data or other scholarly outputs in a repository, like how does the repository curate the data. So you can see that top bar at the left at the <laughs> the bar at the top of your screen in a gray box. Um, that's kind of the overall curation workflow. A repository ingests the data or you deposit the data. We then do some appraisal process to make sure that the data is a good fit for the repository. And then we do our curation process. And DCN partners have the added benefit of being able to connect with expert curators in the network to receive more advanced curation support. After the data is curated and the researcher has signed off and made changes to make the data more findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, we then facilitate access and preserve data for the long term. And with that, I think I actually turn it over to our colleague Wanda to tell me why I might curate data. Yeah, why, why are we here? Why are we curating data? What's important about this? What's the value add? Is there a value add? And all that good stuff. And I just wanna make sure that folks can hear me. I could just get a thumbs up from Michaela, thank you. All right. So data can be messy. It can be uncomprehensible and lack context. And as we see in this data set, there are not, there's no uh, variable labels in the first row. And if we were to discover this data, we wouldn't know, how, we wouldn't be able to reuse it. We would not have any idea what these rows or columns are, units of measurement, anything like that. Um, and so, um, as some of you had said in the in the earlier poll, um, it's, there can be a lot of cleaning. There needs to be context and and lots of things like that. Um, also, why curate um, digital fi file formats are also constantly at risk. File formats can become obsolete. Um, for folks who um, may remember these floppy disks, and then we got smaller floppy disks um, that were not so floppy. Um, I've recently seen people making like chain mail out of those those three and a half or those three point five disks. So. Lots of things to be done with them, um, but not as they were intended. And so we want to make sure that um, we're focusing on uh, formats. And most data is not even discoverable because it's living on a computer or maybe even in a file cabinet. A colleague of ours conducted a qualitative study of public health researchers' information management needs. And one of the participants had all of their past research records in paper format in a file cabinet in their office. And now that person has retired, so who knows where that data lives? Also, I can really appreciate this um, this screenshot of the this computer. Um, the plastic, I don't think it was originally yellow like that. It's um, deteriorating, you know? Um, and so um, we just want to make sure that, that we're uh, conserving and saving our data in formats that we can open. Uh, as So what is data curation as defined by the University of Illinois School of Library and Information Science? Data curation is the active and ongoing management of data through its life cycle and interest and usefulness to scholarship, science, and education curation activities enable data discovery and retrieval, maintain quality and add value and provide reuse over time. I want to highlight this, defini this definition, excuse me. I wanted to highlight in this definition the phrase reuse over time. In other words, we can't just think about sharing this data once or even curating it once. We have to think of this sharing and curation process as an ongoing process, especially as the scholarly outputs are reused. Put another way, data curation is akin to work performed by an art or museum curator. Through the curation process, data are organized, described, cleaned, enhanced, and preserved for public use, much like the work done on paintings or rare books to make the work accessible to the public now and in the future. 
I wanted to highlight here that data curators are well positioned to not only provide feedback on what should be openly sh shared openly, where the output should be shared, and what, if any, access restrictions might be needed, might need to be placed on the data. It is the role of the data curator to support researchers in this effort by providing different levels of curation support. Um, I've heard it once that uh, once described as curators are the fr a friend of the researcher. Uh, and so who is involved in curation? Data curation is a partnership between researchers, repository systems, and data professionals and curators. None of this is done in isolation. We are working together towards the same goal. We're working you know, towards that fairness and find findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. There are different levels of curation. Um, and while presented as sequential, no one level is necessarily ideal or better than the other. Just that data sets can be reviewed at different depths and will impact the findability, accessible fairness um, of the data. And I'd like to emphasize that each level will have different costs and benefits. So the first, the level zero is it's just, just deposited and um, as is. Level one is the record level curation where we look at metadata checks for increased findability. Level two, um, file level curation where we review files, arrangement and perform file format conversions for increased accessibility. Um, and while it might not be the curator that is transforming those um, files, it may be that we are recommending that. Level three, Documentation level curation is a review of the, the documentation and requesting or adding missing information for increased re reusability. And then level four, data level curation, where we've done all of these things. Um, and then we additionally open files and review data contents and may annotate or edit the data for accuracy or interoperability. Um, and like we like I previously said, no one of these is better than the other. Um, it can be a combination, and it, it's actually um, it's a negotiation between cur curators, repositories, and the researchers. And this could be due to time and capacity constraints, knowledge constraints, or even just the data the needs of the data. The simple fact is that not all data needs to be kept forever and curated really in depth. We need to accept this and know when to curate the record and keep on going. This also depends on that partnership that I mentioned in the last slide or iterations between different collaborators as we saw in the previous slide. If a data author does not reply to a curator's questions, it's difficult to move past the level one or level two of this levels of curation. Um, and so I tend to think in, um, in music lyrics and this was reminding me of um, Bonnie Raitt um, you know, that song, I can't make you love me if you don't. So I just needed to, um, for some levity today, I, I've changed these lyrics up a bit. Um, and so I just would like to recite this here for you. Um, again, think of Bonnie Raitt's I Can't Make You Love Me. Um, I was first introduced to this song um, on Days of Our Lives when Bo and Carly, there was something going on between them. I don't know if you remember that back in 1992, 93 or so. Um, but here we go. Because I can't make your data more fair if you don't. You can't make your data more fair if you won't. Curating in the dark in these final hours, I will write down my questions and recommendations, but you won't. No, you won't. I can't make your data more fair if you don't. All right. Thanks for um, being a part of that with me. Um, and so ultimately, the added value is that data is easier for future users to understand, more likely to be trusted by users, as well as the larger scientific community, reproducible, citable, cost-saving, and something you'll hear a lot um, throughout this is fair, fairness, fair. And uh, again, I think we're all familiar with this, but I just want to reiterate because it's important. FAIR stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. All right, I think now it is Sophia's turn.
Yeah, thanks, Wanda. You're always such a tough act to follow. I did not write a song for my section on resources, um, but yeah, I'm now going to talk a little bit. I'm Sophia Lafferty has about some of the resources that the DCN has created or that we've helped to make space for others to create. As we said, we're really focused on community. Um, so I'm going to talk through these, but I first want to emphasize that these resources are currently written primarily for the audience of a data curator who is actually working within a repository. So somebody like myself or Wanda. Um, and it's a slightly different perspective than a researcher who may be um, curating their own data, but we think that there is a lot of utility across audiences. Next slide. So the first resource I want to share is our curated model. These are the steps that we in the DCN take whenever reviewing a data set. But I also want to, again, emphasize that the data curation process is going to look different in different repositories, and it may even look different across different data sets within the same repository. But what I like about the curated model is it's a conceptual way to think about common steps in curation. So curated is an acronym for these series of steps, including first, checking the files and reading the documentation. This is where a curator might be creating a file inventory, doing risk mitigation, making sure that data can be openly and ethically shared, or doing some of that appraisal or selection. After you check the files, then you're understanding the data or trying to. So this is where you're digging deeper and you might identify some quality assurance issues. Or one of the things I'm really focusing upon is making sure that the documentation is complete for someone else to be able to properly interpret those files. After you do check and understand, that's where you're going to be going back and communicating with the researcher or depositor and requesting any missing information or changes. After you have that conversation, then a curator might actually be augmenting the data set. So this might be enhancing some of that metadata, maybe adding enhancements to a README file, uh, signing those DOIs. Um, next is transforming file formats for reuse. So Wanda already mentioned how um, some file formats don't last forever. So curators might be making recommendations or even potentially transforming um, files themselves from kind of proprietary formats into more open standardized formats. And then finally, E is for evaluate for fairness. So this is again where we're step taking a step back and kind of looking at the entire data package to make sure that it aligns as best as we can with the fair guiding principles. And then finally, D is documenting your curation activities. So we want to make sure that we're always keeping a good log and information on kind of the provenance and changes to any files. Um, so I also want to note that while we present this in kind of a linear sequential fashion, curators um, may be jumping or back and forth between different steps. I personally, for instance, am thinking about what transformations we might want to suggest during that check and understand step. Um, so another part of how we've operationalized the curated workflow is we've developed checklists. So you can go to our website and we have checklists for each of the steps. You're good, Wanda. I, you, <laughs> next slide. We're good. All right. So the next um, resource that I want to highlight are primers. So primers are essentially quick start or how-to manuals that were created to guide, again, curators through the curation of specific disciplines, types of data, file formats, or curation topics. So these are peer-reviewed, community-developed resources with contributions from workshop participants um, by DCN curators and others within the information science and library science community. So we currently have over 40 primers that you can locate on the DCN website um, or via our GitHub. And I want to note that this is a living collection. So we're always new primers are being added often. I think there's a couple in the pipeline right now. Um, and if you're interested in working on a primer, we're always um, welcoming further contributions. So you can just email us and we do have kind of a standard structured process. Next slide. All right, so within the DCN, we're also very focused on the importance of education and training. So one of our core education um, resources are what we're calling our curated fundamentals trainings. So these workshops use that curated model as the foundation to discuss the curation process in practice. So we really try to focus these trainings on making time for peer-to-peer -peer engagement, as well as having active learning using real-world data sets. 
Typically these workshops are one and a half days, but we've also held some half day versions, both in person and virtually. And since 2017, um, we actually just got this data. We have over, um, we've trained over 300 information professionals and delivered 17.5 days of training. Next slide. Um, we also have an asynchronous version of our training available for the curated model via an online set of learning modules. Um, this training also includes hands-on activities with the data set and is an introduction, I think a pretty nice introduction to applied data curation skills. All right, so building on the curated training foundation, over the past two years, we've also been developing new training materials focused specifically on the curation of four unique data types, including code, simulation-based research, geospatial data, and scientific images. So this work has been funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services grant. And what we really focused on is, again, wanting to harness the expertise across our community. So we used a cohort model. So each data type had a cohort with four people and a mentor. Um, we hosted a pilot workshop in 2023 to test out these materials. And I will say that these trainings are primarily currently focused on, again, that kind of synchronous in-person learning experience. Um, but I do particularly want to highlight that these training materials um, are now openly available in our GitHub repository for reuse by others. And we're also looking forward to doing some more planning to host more workshops focused on these data types in the future. So you can contact us if you're interested in partnering on education. Next slide. All right, so now I'm gonna switch gears just a little bit and end with some of our resources, as well as our contributions to data sharing and curation research um, through some past and present projects. Um, so first in 2016, the DCN went through a process to actually identify and define 47 discrete data curation activities. So there's a lot that can go into data curation. The DCN then um, used those activities and performed focus groups with 91 researchers across six different institutions to understand which of those activities are actually the most important to researchers. In 2021 to 2022, the DCN performed research to understand that specific value of data curation. I'm gonna say a little bit more in depth about that um, research in just a moment. In 2023 to 24, the DCN worked on a research project to understand more broadly how often um, the Association of Research Libraries institutional repositories, so those are repositories based within individual institutions, are leveraged for publishing research data. So this included a review of whether or not an individual institution like Duke has an IR or repository dedicated just to data or potentially both. Um, the data overwhelmingly demonstrated that researchers are adopting institutional solu solutions to share their research data, um, and therefore we need continuing investment by academic libraries. And then finally, the DCN has also partnered on additional research and initiatives with various different groups, including Ithaca SNR on data communities, which was funded by NSF, um, ARL again on the realities of academic data sharing, or what's called RADS for short, and this was funded through NSF and IMLS, and most recently with the NIH Office of Data Science Strategy on the, it's called STAIRS, which stands for the Summit for Academic Institutional Readiness in Data Sharing. And we're happy to share that the final report from that, um, that summit just got released. Next slide. Okay, so as Wanda has discussed, within the DCN, we do believe in the value of creation, but we really wanted to take a more formal research-based approach to understand specifically what is that perceived or actual value of curation in practice? So what we did is we performed two surveys that were targeting two different populations. One being the perspective of those that are actually doing the curation within a repository. So those data curation librarians. Um, the other being the perspective of the depositors or the researchers who are uploading their data to the repository and receiving curation services. So I don't have time to highlight all of the findings from this research today, 
Um, but I will say that both have been published within PLOS, and you can find the links on the value of curation page on the DCN website. But I'm going to end the presentation with just a couple, um, couple key findings as we're talking about um, the value of curation. Next slide. Okay, so this, this slide is from the survey of data repositories performing curation. So that was, you know, people like me were answering this, this, this question. And we asked um, about, again, their perceived value and impact on the data curation has on data sharing. And so um, on the on the left hand side, we did ask them to actually rank the what they see as the impact of data curation, and we had 14 different categories. So the top five things that people ranked as the impact of data curation was the that it helps with the ability for people to find that data, to understand the data, to use the data, to access the data, and then also to preserve the data. Um, which I always thought was interesting that you see some of those terms from FAIR also showing showing up here. I guess that's not, not too surprising. Um, and then the other graph is, again, trying to get at that idea of value and impact. And it's showing how the majority of respondents agreed with the statement both that data curation adds value to the data sharing process. So that's that blue bar and agree. Um, and then that they believe that data curation actually outweighs the effort and cost of data sharing. We know, as was pointed out um, in the word cloud, this does take time and energy. It does have costs associated with it. So I always found this result to be really, really helpful to see that people are thinking, you know, it's worth that time and effort they're putting into it. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, this is this is my final slide. And um, so for both of those surveys, we asked both data repositories and those end users, you know, what is the most value added curation action taken by this repository? And this was actually a free text field because we wanted to hear from people and their experiences. So right now I'm going to end by reading a few quotes from what the depositors or the researchers actually said. So one researcher said, caught mistakes, increased data set quality. quality. Another researcher said, helping me prepare the data metadata for long-term access. The curator's expertise in this area was very helpful as I was not as familiar with what metadata required to ensure easy long-term utility access of my data set. And then finally, the curation process makes the data more accessible and readable for other scientists. This amplifies the impact of our research. So um, while it's always nice to hear that people appreciate the work, it was also really great to see in this research um, how, how the work that we're doing as curators, as well as the work that researchers are doing, that they really did see a positive impact from that additional work and effort. Um, so just to sum up, within the DCN, we are really focused on data curation. We want to help make data uh, more reusable, more reproducible, being shared ethically. And we're really excited to continue to do this work and partner with others like the Center for Open Science on transforming research with data curation practices. So now I'm gonna pass it over to Gretchen to talk more about how the OSF can enable um, data curation practices so thanks. Thanks all. And I'll send it's all you, Gretchen. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can use OSF to do some of these things um, a little bit better. Um, and go ahead to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to talk about ways that you can incorporate some of these curation activities into OSF that you may or may not be aware of. Um, so some of them are pretty obvious and some others are newer things that may not be as noticeable. So I'm going to talk about all of these if you want to go to the next slide. So the first and biggest one is to create metadata. Um, so when you create a project um, at, in OSF, you have the option to create a description. Uh, creating a useful description there is is very valuable. That um, that information is indexed in our search engine. It gets shared out through our API. That is a way to increase the findability and understandability of what is in your project. You can include anything in an OSF project. So at a minimum, having a description is a, is a really valuable thing. Um, but we do have additional metadata for our uh, projects and registrations. So you can see in the top bar there, I've um, circled the metadata button that opens the metadata tab if you want to go to the next um, tab. So you can create some additional metadata that's very helpful here. 
Um, I've highlighted a couple of fields uh, that are really crucial and are fairly new. Um, we have a field called resource type uh, that uses a controlled vocabulary of about 20 or so terms that come from data site. Um, and that's a way that you can indicate uh, with more specificity what is in this project or subcomponent, which is a, basically a sub project, a child project of your project. And I'm going to talk about components in a second as well. Um, and this vocabulary includes very specific things like study registrations, conference papers, data sets, but it also includes broad things like just image or text or collection so that you can characterize kind of whatever it is that you are um, putting into this project. And then this data, this metadata field is uh, filtered in our search engine. So it really helps people to at a glance understand what your content is and to be able to find it. Um, there's also the ability to add a, a language um, and funder information. But one of the really important pieces of, of metadata to add is a license. Um, so we do have a set of licenses that you can choose from. Um, you can also write your own license if that is what you need to do, although it's not personally what I would recommend that you do, but you can. Um, and just like the other metadata, you can set the license at the component level. So if there are things in your project that have different kind of terms of use with them, you can apply that um, at each level if you use the components to um, organize your project. You can go ahead to the next slide. As I mentioned, you can create that metadata at the project level, at the subcomponent or child project level. You can also create it at the file level. So there is a limited amount of metadata that you can create at the file level, but it is, again, important. You can give it a title, which is different than the file name. Um, which is sometimes very useful. You can again give it a description. You can again name the resource type. So if you have a project that's lots of different things, but you haven't created subcomponents, you can go in and actually tag each individual file as a specific um, type of material and the language. Um, if you go to the next, OSF also, if you upload your content directly into OSF, we will automatically create checksums, uh, MD5 and SHA-2 checksums, which are important for authenticity or integrity of your, of your data down the line. Um, and we also record, although it's not shown here, the MIME type, the date created, and the date modified, and we also do versioning. So if you upload a new version of a file, we will keep both of those files and we will show you the kind of audit trail of how that happened. And these can all be really crucial later on for piecing together the story of the data, how it was created, what it is, and how to interpret it. If you go ahead one more, in addition to that metadata that's built into the OSF, we also have a new feature where you can use one of these community created metadata templates. And these templates are very for very specific discipline communities for the most part, and we're always interested in adding some more of these. Um, but there is one that's just called OSF Enhanced Metadata. If you go ahead and click forward, that actually gives you access to a number of uh, properties that are in the data site metadata schema, if you're familiar with that, that are not part of the kind of general OSF metadata. So you can go in and you can add some really um, descriptive, uh, really um, uh, detailed and specific things like types of contributors, um, types of descriptions, specific kinds of dates for different activities that happened. And again, that uh, that specific metadata template can be created at the project level, at the component level, or at the file level. So you really have the ability in OSF to create a lot of robust metadata, although um, it is not maybe immediately obvious if you're only using OSF um, casually and haven't explored these features. So if you go to the next slide, OSF projects in particular also feature a wiki, um, and it's not always used. And I think that that's a shame because the wiki is where you can go in and really create a, your readme content. Um, you can create content that explains what, to, what you will find in this project, um, that tells people uh, how to interpret it, um, what, it, what you mean by certain terms. Um, this is the readme um, or the wiki for a digital libraries course actually that I teach. Um, so the project includes just slides um, and, and a video. And so the wiki page just brings that all into context and it's where I'm able to tell students, here's the objectives, here's why we're gonna go through this, um, here's what to look for. And it provides links in a central place to all of those different files. 
So uh, wikis in OSF um, can also have many pages. Um, so wikis are a great way to really contextualize what it is that you are putting into your OSF project. If you want to go forward, I've mentioned several times components. I think components are like very useful in OSF and sadly, perhaps a little underutilized. Um, so a component in OSF is just a sub project. So you get all of the features that you get in your parent project, um, but you get a child of it um, right underneath. So it can have its own wiki, it can have its own metadata, it can have its own license. Um, but it's a great way to organize your content. So as you can see in this template, there's place for hypothesis, place for methods, um, a place for your plan, your analysis plan, your actual data. Um, and so using those components is a great way to uh, keep your OSF, you know, from becoming your junk drawer and actually having it all kind of in neat little dividers for everything. Um, if you want to go forward. And then the last thing that I'll mention about OSF, a lot of folks like to use our different store on, storage add-on uh, locations, which is great. You can connect OSF to your Google Drive or your box or uh, at wherever you may be storing your files. A lot of institutions like that because they want um, folks at their institution to use those specific research spaces. Um, but it can be problematic. As you can see, this is a just kind of a dummy collection that I use for demonstration. And I connected a Dropbox account some time ago, but I no longer have valid credentials for that Dropbox account. So uh, if this is something that's going to happen, if you're using OSF now uh, and you have access to a, and you're perhaps giving access to a personal or, or institutional drive, OneDrive or Google Drive, as you are kind of rounding out and doing your create, curation and finishing up your project, you might want to consider moving that into something that is more stable. So native OSF storage. Um, we also link to some data repositories like Dataverse and Figshare. And this is an area where we're doing a lot of work right now. Um, we have an NSF grant to really build out our integration features and make them much easier to use. So keep an eye on this space. There's going to be lots more options for these kinds of things moving forward. If you want to go forward one slide. So the other thing I want to talk about just briefly is our institutional curation features. Um, so we do have an institutional membership program, and we've been working on a lot of things uh, to actually enable more of this curation, collaborative curation work. Um, if you go to the next slide, <clears throat> our institutional membership at OSF, if you're unaware of it, um, you can find out more about it. Um, at cos.io, um, look under tools, um, and we have information there about our membership program. But basically what it is, is we integrate with an institution's authentication service, single sign-on, to verify who their users are. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, we can identify all the content created by creators at the institution and aggregate it together. Um, so you can see what's going on at your institution. Um, if you go one more slide forward, um, we also put uh, the institution's name and logo on individual materials. I think there should be one more animation here. Yeah, there you go. Um, so in addition to being able to, you know, look at it and verify who this user is, that they're really part of this community, it also puts the identifier on this material. And as we get, as we share the metadata out to data site or through our API, those institutions are, um, uh, uh, marked are, are a part of that um, metadata for that material that goes out. The flip side of this then, if you go to the next slide, is that we can offer our institutional um, liaisons who are often research support staff or data management librarians, we can offer them metrics on what their users are publicly doing in OSF. So we can show them, here are uh, users who have used OSF, here, here's the content they've created, um, here's when they created it, what types of files they're uploading, what types of storage they're using, um, so that those uh, data management librarians or curators can begin to see what's going on and where they may be able to intervene for some help. Um, in addition to this, this um, is a new feature that we'll be rolling out in the next month or so for all of our institutional members. And soon after that, we are going to start our next part of that process, which if you go one more slide, is a curator role actually in OSF. Um, so this is going to be building off of the current workflow we have for 
Um, sometimes we have some registries and preprints that are moderated by communities. So it's taken that idea of having someone who's a point person for the institution um, be able to see what's going on and then being able to interact with the creator if they choose and if the creator uh, chooses to work with them. So it will uh, allow um, a liaison, again, the librarian, the data uh, support uh, person, to be able to identify content that, and then contact, reach out to the administrator and say, hey, I noticed that you're creating this. I can offer some curation services if you would like to add me as a curator. The curator role then will be added to the project by the project admin, and the curator can uh, help with the metadata. The curator can help with that um, file reformatting, um, can help with the organization. And they are they have that access to the content, but don't get added to the you know bibliographic um, citation or anything like that. They can be given the access for a limited amount of time and then removed if that, if that is what they would like to do. We're also um, looking at how it can be um, enabled from the other side so that researchers who are part of these institutions can be notified there's a curator from your institution if you would like some curatorial help. Um, and here, and if you, you know, follow this link, we will contact them and let them know who you are, and then you can take it from there. So really, our um, what we see our role is, is facilitating that relationship between researchers and curators, and um, putting some tools into OSF that can make that um, communication a little smoother. So we're going to start working on this as soon as we get the dashboard, um, the metrics dashboard launched. So we hope to see this um, uh, unveiled early in 2025 for our institutional members. Um, so I think that after this, we just have a wrap up. Um, not sure who <laughs> from Data Curation Network wants to close us out. We do have a couple questions in the chat um, and we uh, in the Q&A and we certainly have time to take more. Yeah, I'm happy to wrap us up and um, transition us to the Q&A section. So this is just a stay in touch slide. Um, we don't have a single DCN email, but you can find us on our website, datacuriationnetwork.org, or we have a monthly newsletter that you can subscribe to. That's a real good time. Um, and so with that, um, I'll transition to the Q&A. So I'm gonna actually read them in reverse order because we have a follow-up question for our second question. So Nicholas, oh, am I, supposed, am I allowed to say names, Gretchen? Okay, cool, good, because I just yeah, did. <laughs> uh, Nicholas wrote, um, regarding the data curation primers, do you have examples of content domain specific primers as opposed to discipline specific, method specific, or data type specific primers? And I'm not going to lie to you, Nicholas, I, I think I need a little more clarification as, as to, um, could you give us an example of what you might be thinking of in the chat or the Q&A? Um, and then Sophia, Wanda, and I can answer the question a little better. Um, but the short version is we're always accepting suggestions for new primers if you would like to help write one. And Nicholas, I think you also could raise your hand if you would like to just talk oh. and I can unmute you. And anyone else who has a question can as well. If you raise your hand, um, if you don't want to type in, we can we can answer them that way. I will ask you all to moderate, and we can go to the first question. Well, and I I think you know I, I, I Rachel just put um, a response of highlighting the archaeology data primer, and I think that's could be seen as discipline specific, but um, it also is domain specific and it has different types of content as well. I'm also wondering, we do have a primer that's specifically just for qualitative data. And we know there's researchers that are doing qualitative research across different different disciplines and domains, although that could maybe be seen as a method. Um, so I think we've tried pretty hard with the primers. They kind of started out more format specific and they've become a lot broader um, to include different types of research, different types of methods, different types of disciplines, different types of content. Um, so like we have one for clinical trials research. So yeah, if there's, there's other examples of what you're looking for, but definitely would encourage you to look through the um, the list on the website that Michaela posted. Looks like Nicholas has just uh, commented in the chat. 
not sure how to raise my hand, but as content domain specific examples, e.g. scientific study of religion that spans disciplines like demography, economics, neuroscience, religious studies, sociology, psychology, history, epidemiology, evolutionary biology, and so on. That's a good question. So I'm happy to take the first uh attempt at answering this and Sophia and Wanda will will follow with their thoughts. My thought is that that's such a good question. Um, and I, I want to like kind of tease it out because I come from an interdisciplinary background as well. And while there are definitely unique considerations with interdisciplinary data, with some research projects, you can kind of boil it down to its component parts and say like, okay, so there's economics in here. Well, what kind of statistical data is in there? And like kind of curate that piece. So you can kind of curate it in pieces while keeping an eye on the whole. And so that's why I don't think we've had a primer like that yet is because we've kind of been building these pieces. Um, but that's not to say there will never be one. It just hasn't been our area of focus. Uh, Sophia or Wanda? Okay, I saw. Oh, go ahead. No, I think that's good. Awesome. Well, if you can't tell, I am chomping at the bit to get to the first question because I have so many thoughts about it. So the very first question we got um, was from Peter Geffen. Do you see the need to change file formats in the future and who will do the change? And there's a lot here that can be unpacked. Um, I am assuming, Peter, that this question is coming from, you know, Will you change file formats after they've been deposited into a repository? It's 15 years from now. We can no longer open Excel documents. That's a very real concern that digital archivists and digital preservation experts are working with um, regularly. That's one of the reasons why it's so important to work with a data curator. We can help recommend formats that we think will be more um, preservable and reusable in the long term. In terms of specifically, like, we call it uh, format migration, if you've heard that term, where you migrate from one file format to another. Um, that is very dependent on the repository. So some repositories are going to take a, yes, we're going to migrate it, no problem, we'll do it all in the back end kind of approach, whereas others are going to preserve the data as it's provided to them. So if you give me an Excel spreadsheet, I will keep that Excel spreadsheet until we deaccession it, even if we may no longer be able to open it. Um, so I know it's not really a satisfactory answer, but it's such a good question. It's something we talk about a lot because file formats change all the time. I don't know if you've ever opened a 1997 spreadsheet. It is not the same as they once were. Uh, Sophia or Wanda, do you have more to add on that one? All right, I'll keep going then. Um, so the next one uh, I see in the Q&A from, I sincerely apologize if I mispronounce your name, from Malgorzada, how data curators are similar or different to data reviewers, and could data curators work as data reviewers for journals? This is another great question. Um, I have some feelings, as I'm sure Sophia and Wanda will. See, I'm making you all this time. You got to chime in on this one. I think that they are complementary but different roles. As a data curator, I am looking at your data from the perspective of long-term access use and reuse. So, but less from the perspective of like validation. I'm not checking to make sure that your study data backs up what your study says, whereas I feel like a data reviewer might be doing more of that. So I think that's kind of the key difference. Um, not to suggest that data curators do not have disciplinary expertise or could not do that, but just kind of a different role. Sophia. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. I do think there's a few disciplines where we might see data curators also taking on some of that, like um, verification processes. I know in some of the social sciences and um, economics where um, there's partnerships between journals and data curators working within specific repositories to kind of enable um, verification for reproducibility. But I think that that is still very much a new type of model. And I think one of the things that we try to enable um, in that partnership with journals even more so, especially within institutional data repositories, is how can we get access to the data reviewers when they need to provide that kind of verification or review of the data. So I know there are some systems that provide provide private links. Um, I think you can do that via OSF, right? Like, so where you can share the data um, kind of 
before the publication comes out. So that's where I see some of that partnership sometimes with data curators and data reviewers as well. Yeah, and I I like to think of myself as like the others have said like we're we're like a, a kind of like a peer reviewer of the data. However, we might not have the the like top expertise like the you know we might not be a, an expert, and I think that's okay because and this is not meant to sound too negative, but if I like had complete understanding of your data, um and could could see um, what was, if something was inac inaccurate um, in your data um, and things like that, I might be that researcher rather than the data curator, right? So like there's a separation of roles too um, and we can't be everything to, to um, all the time. On, on the other side, I like also like looking at it with um, sometimes uh, not necessarily a novice eye, but um, what 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 is missing for me to make sense of this as not an expert on your research? Um, and so how can I fill in those holes for others? I think we probably have time to answer one more of these questions. I so, know, we're actually uh, on like five just came in. <laughs> I know, sorry. Um, so you can take your pick of what you want to respond to. And uh, as I said, well, I will say everyone will get an uh, email after this and 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 you can figure out how to pester Michaela for more answers from that. <laughs> Sophia or Wanda, preference on which one we answer? Live. Which one we answer live, we will send written responses to the rest. Yeah, I think I can I can put in a couple of the primers that are resources related to the IRB data sharing and those. And so maybe if you guys want to take a step at the um, documenting the curation process. Yeah, we can definitely do that. And then um, the question was just how, not just, the question is how are you documenting the curation process, which is a very, very good question. The short answer is we essentially have a readme file for what we do. Um, it's called a curator log. That's typically, I'm sorry, Wanda, I don't need to answer this. Would, do you want to answer this? I, I can. Um, many, many of the institutions are using a curator log, like Michaela just said. Um, it's where we document all of the um, files that were originally shared. We... Um, also kind of are tracking our changes in that. Um, and we use that to kind of guide us with the R step, the the, um, the reaching out for more information. And so we're kind of tracking that. Um, some institutions will keep it in the metadata um, behind the scenes. Others will just keep it on their um, servers or um, at their institutions because um, not that there's anything nefarious or anything in, in those um, curator logs, but um, if we do find a mistake or something like that, we don't want to necessarily make it public. Um, and but still being transparent, we've documented that change um, of different files or different metadata things that we've added. And so curator logs um, are how we're tracking that. I think there are some of the institutions in the DCN that you can see the changes right in their repository. Um, uh, if they've um, versioned something or uploaded new files and, and things like that. Okay, great. I was just grabbing a copy of um, questions that are in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, so uh, thank you all for joining us today. I think this has been really great. You will receive an email in the next couple of days with a link to the video and the slides. Um, so from the slides, you can certainly find how to um, contact our uh, friends at Data Curation Network. Um, we will also try to answer these questions. We can put them into the OSF project um, uh, where the slides will be, um, as well as um, in the email to you all. So again, thank you all so much for joining us uh, and have a great rest of your day. Bye.